somebody's using a, a crescent wrench as a hammer and it's like that's not how that's supposed to be used but but then also i don't know you kind of have to do that because you have to acknowledge that you're the point one percent of people who did the the reading right before the lecture you know, it's all about, like, I love, like, I love, love, love the comic. I don't mind changing it or retro, because it's a different medium, different age. Like, I, those things don't bother me, so I wasn't going into it. It's like, oh, don't do this. I do, like, I was frustrated with the movie because, like, I didn't think Snyder got Ozpandius. I didn't think he understood what he did. You know, I think he got Rorschach, which I liked, you know. But other than that, it was just the movie itself. Parts of it were good, but I'm like, man, I don't feel cohesion there. But... I don't, I don't mind changing stuff at all because I think that everybody who inherits it, you know, you have to figure out how to make it work. Well, but <clears throat> I, th I think if I'm reading Justin right, he had frustration of like, uh, okay, you're just saying that line because that's a line from the book. You're exactly. not saying it no. remotely. Oh, not, not only a line from the book, but also a pivotal, like, cementing, like, uh, 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 etched in marble line from the book as a throwaway thing to just kind of get heat on on people and it was uh, i don't know i mean uh, i'm no I'm, I'm with you because because i've definitely experienced those things where i was offended at how and, and and to be honest that's a big complaint about a lot of my star wars beef with eh, say rogue one where it's like okay look i get it you have to you have to wedge in all of these winks and nods but the truth is, uh, I can't expect everybody to be as familiar with the backstory in the extended, expanded universe canon or whatever as me. And so for every 10 of these grossly clumsy winks and nods that I'm seeing, maybe one will sound vaguely familiar to somebody and give it a warm glow. And I think that's, that's the frustration uh, with that. I would argue that those winks and nods are part of the reason why they suffer so much is because you know like empire is a very different movie than star wars and that's part of the strength as you go from star wars to empire and you're like characters are the characters can come closer together in their own way and the story is so different and then the familiarity that they've tried to do with the new ones is sort of frustrating because you're like yeah we saw this we saw this or you know i don't know i i and then the, then the remember this remember this remember this like yeah i still feel like i'm in the same room you know yeah um I, I will in general say I I I cannot imagine adapting something like Watchmen in that it is obviously inherently a story about politics and you know however for you know uh, you want to take that from the background to the foreground is up to you but uh Alan Moore is crazy like he's a, it's a crazy person's view of it that resonates, and I don't know if you can take him literally. I, I, I don't, yeah. I don't know, because he's like, you know, going back, uh, I've, I've immersed myself into the, into the online conversation about this, uh, and you know, you go back and you look at like his, his commentary on some of the characters, and he's like, who Alan Moore thinks is the heroes and villains of this story can be radically different than the people yeah. that think are the heroes and villains in this story because Alan Moore's crazy. And that's why he's, I mean, his, the way his unique way of thinking is kind of unmatched and it's hard to then say like, cool. All right. Well, these are the things that I identify with. We'll take a photo. I don't know. It, but, 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 but. There it goes. I'm already breaking my promise not to talk about this publicly. Oops. Yeah. I told you guys. I told you we were going live. Y'all said it. Y'all no, told I it. Couldn't. Bryce, you did everything. You put up the sign. There's a big <laughs> blinking light. And uh there was just Yeah, I just couldn't I just couldn't help it. Just couldn't help myself. Just had to get on out there. Fire enough hot takes. <laughs> we'll get started with the weird things in here in just a moment. Hello everybody. Here Yo. for the Weird Things Podcast. It's Monday. It's Monday. Yeah. Back at the podcast factory for another week. That's right. We are, uh, we're doing it, folks. I uh, so I I I only I only half mentioned this in a in a tweet uh, over the over the week. I explained it more on stream, but only a few people watched that. Uh, I got into a car car crash. Oh, jeez! Did you survive? I. It turns out I did. 
shooting it. <laughs> uh, the I got I got rear-ended on a green on a green arrow, and then it, the guy ran. It was a hit and run. What? Oh, That's right. Um, Which, uh, to, as as best I understand, that mm-hmm. equals person of questionable uh, immigration status. Uh, uh, possibly uninsured. So I, yeah, I, I caught his license plate uh, when when he left, and the cops ran it, and they said that for the plate that I gave them, which I am very, very pretty sure that I got, I remembered right in the moment because I I saw him leave, and so I wrote it down on my phone. Um, they said the the policy was expired, or it was a, it was a it was a uh, yeah it was an expired expired plates. Policy. No yeah. policy. Oh, like, the they insurance. pulled up a policy, but the the insurance policy was expired. So got it. Um, depending on better than them saying that car hasn't been seen on the road since 1957. <laughs> Your own little spooky Halloween tale. Woo. And uh, so, depending on if 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 that is the case or not, uh, depends on what insurance coverage kicks in. But um, uh, hopefully, it shouldn't be too bad. I got a nice new 2019. Uh, car and it's it's like a, it's an SUV too so it's like it rides really nice and it's big it's uh, uh, so what about the are they gonna any more about the person who did it are they the, how they're the you, you know, of, uh, uh, I haven't heard yet they the insurance adjuster asked me to go and get the police report um, yeah. uh, and 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 I it wasn't available that day when I got home and was thinking about yeah. it, so I'll check today. Um, uh, but but there were there were cops like on in on the cross street of the intersection right there when it happened, so they were on the scene immediately, but they didn't see the guy leave or they saw him leave and yeah. they thought he was avoiding he was just avoiding yeah. like the, the stoppage. Um, so I, I I hope they catch what? this person. That- that's good that they saw that though, because that uh, between because of the rather than you having just reporting a random plate, the fact that his the cops can say that we saw that vehicle leaving the scene is good. Yeah, um, and, um, and and the fact that it was all um, damage to my car, I actually tapped the guy in front of me. Uh, the fact yeah. that all the damage was on the rear end is is making it pretty easy for the insurance since they're yeah. pretty quickly. Yeah, I got hit and run. It was a guy who who stopped and then he left. And it turned out that he had suspended license, all this other stuff. He just, just, mm. and it was a frustrating experience where the prosecutor eventually says, oh, you know, he offered to pay. Are you happy? Would you, would you be willing to drop it if he paid for your charge? I'm like, I'm like, who are you working for? I'm like, I'm mm. like, he offered to pay me like cash on the scene to not report it. I'm like, and I said, no, because I knew that was somebody who did, who's got illegal, you know, has been doing illegal things. And now you want to just, you know, it was just frustrating, frustrating, uh, Anyway, so that was my Friday. So who's feeling Sorry, weird? But- <laughs> Crash uh, things. Uh, I'm feeling good to go. Are you guys good to go? I got the thing that you sent me, yep. Andrew, and it is hidden okay. away. Cool. Uh, yeah. Anything else? All good? Yep. Yeah. All right. Then, Andrew, why don't you take us away in three, two. Hello, and welcome to the Weird Things Podcast. I'm Andrew Mean, joined by Justin Robert Young. Hello. Mr. Brian Brushwood. Damon Lindelof did nothing wrong. <laughs> and Mr. Bryce Castillo. Don't, don't poke the bear, Brian. <laughs> get, in my, get in my kitchen. You're not allowed. No <laughs> poking the kitchen. That's the embroidered sign I'm putting up. Brian, I'm going to go look through the IMDb here. Uh, I like World War Z. I like World War Z. <laughs> okay. All right. Except for Prometheus, Damon Lindelof did nothing wrong. <laughs> and Tomorrowland in the last several seasons of Lost. Other than that, oh, Cowboys versus Aliens. <laughs> but, but other than that. Oh, man. Yeah, I, I I don't know if that'll end up being a whole After Things episode or not, but uh, in the pre-show we were talking about uh, the new Watchmen, and uh, I didn't I didn't expect it to be as polarizing as as it has been. It's it's really interesting here on the podcast. Justin uh, did not have a good time. I did have a good time. Andrew refused to even watch it. Don't, don't distill. I have very complicated feelings that I resolved to not to not make a big deal about. Okay, all right, all right. We, we'll put yeah, a pin and, in it. And my- my position is I'm waiting. I'm waiting to hear what other people say. I'm waiting. I'm like, there's a lot of great stuff out there, and you know, I, I love that source material. So I'll like, I'll wait to see what other people are. Ah, oh, it's great. I'm like, okay, I'll go run and go. And I've had that happen where I've had people like, there have been shows. I'm like, 
yeah, I'm not going to go see it. And then it ra- then it's great. And also I'm like, wow, this was amazing. You know, and so well, and, like, and we even I- talked on the show. Wasn't Gravity one of those that like uh, it didn't take the first time you watched it, but the second yeah. time you liked it more? Oh, Harry Potter, like the first like this is a children's book. <laughs> you know, and, and uh, finally, yeah. So I'm I I'm one of these people that like. If I'm like, I don't that Kool-Aid looks gross, you know, and then they're like, no, it's really good Kool-Aid. Like, ah, it looks gross. And like, ah, I don't like the taste of it. And like, no, just drink it all. Then I'll be like, oh, wow, this is amazing Kool-Aid. So we'll see. We'll see. It, it is hey, one of my favorite ongoing segments is the at various moments, each of us are the latest to get into a trend, <laughs> like often years uh, behind everybody else. <laughs> oh. Yeah. Uh, I'm embarrassed at. <laughs> my, girlfriend and I, my girlfriend and I just started watching Community. <laughs> oh! <laughs> so I was just like, yeah, ding, ding. Um, listen, uh, let's change the tone here. I want you to imagine that you're, you're a parent. Okay. okay. All right. Trying real hard to imagine this. Yeah, yeah I know. You, you, a caring parent. And oh, oh, okay. All right. Stretching it. Got <laughs> it. All right. <laughs> you go tuck the baby away. In his crib, put the baby away, say good night. Now you feel good because you've got a baby camera on there to watch your child. That's you what know. we call them, baby cameras, yes. Yep. You shut the door, close, walk down the hall, you sit down and maybe make yourself a, a cup of cocoa or whatever like this. And it's maybe a little bit, you know, creepy night, a little bit of a wind and the house is dark and you're alone. Nobody else is home, just you and the baby. And you take a sip, you set the coffee cup down, and you're starting to feel tired. And you're like, oh, let me check on the baby. And you pull open your app to go have a peek to see how the baby is doing. And then you see this. Um, okay. I see, looks like three screenshots. The, uh, it's just the baby, wait, wait. Okay, it looks in the center frame like the baby is holding a doll that suddenly has become animated and has a horrified screaming face. Is is it, mm. am I the only one seeing this? What? No, no, no. Yeah, I, I would because I would assume doll is a good guess. It looks to me like it's just a screaming ghost baby. Like, but but yes, from that. If I were then to try to rationalize it as something that wasn't a screaming ghost baby, I would agree with your with your your but, doll theory. But but even then, like as a doll, they don't traditionally make dolls with horrified screaming expressions on them. So you're back on my side with screaming ghost baby, eh? <laughs> Yes. So now your heart's racing, thump, 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 thump. And you've got to go maybe up the stairs. You've got a long ways to go to get there. Your brain is trying to figure out, what am I seeing? My child doesn't have a screaming ghost baby doll. I only have one child. Uh, I mean, to be honest, what I'm thinking. Can we we table uh, the fact that we got a great marketing opportunity? Uh, uh, But we can get to that after we're done here. But yeah, all right. (laughs) No, this is terrifying. Terrifying. Also, also, I've definitely uh, already posted this photo on Reddit, and I'm already seeking that karma before I go upstairs. <laughs> like, <laughs> I'm about to go inspect my daughter's crib, and this is what I think is there. But I'll stop and answer questions for more karma. AMA. <laughs> <laughs> Brian's at the landing between the steps, stops his phone, checks to see to answer anything. <laughs> uh, it really does look like a freaking crazy ghost baby i mean so in in all seriousness what i would look at that and say okay how do i rationalize this i would guess you're looking at just this is like a a noise right this is something is pinched and folded in a way that is just our our brain is making it look between the shadows or whatever like it's just making it look because it does like to get that face, that screaming ghost baby face, you don't really need a lot, right? You just need a curve, two dots, and a horrifying uh, mouth screaming about the afterlife. Yeah. And all the sins. <laughs> well, but but you're right. After below that is all of, uh, you know, like some kind of Fiji mermaid fold of of uh, blanket 
such that you see what looks like feet down at the bottom of it, a midsection in the middle. What is that face? Uh, look, Andrew, I have to know what is going on. Why am I looking at a screaming ghost baby? You have to know. I know. And you're about to open up the door. And now you're thinking, if it's a demon, you got to prepare yourself. But demons aren't real. But what am I seeing? Well, uh, okay. If my extensive research in uh, The Good Place has taught me anything, it's that the demon uh, almost certainly is going to be super ripped and attractive. So I start to steal... <laughs> my own sense of self-esteem <laughs> before I go in. <laughs> because you're afraid that the demon baby in your child's crib might be more muscular than you are. Yes, I'm glad we're on the same page. Okay, yes. <laughs> or a 6,000 foot tall squid. Yeah. <laughs> yes, uh, either or. <laughs> about that for Brian is that it is it is uh, the, the most realistic look into the psyche of Brian Brushwood that you can possibly <laughs> ask for. I'm afraid I'm going to have a pose down with a demon. <laughs> I'm afraid, look, I got, it's not that I'm going to face this demon. I'm here for the demon. I'm just really open it's paunchy. Because let's be honest, <laughs> I haven't hit the gym in the same way that I wanted to. There's just been a lot going on with the property. I'm just thinking like as I open the door, I'm like come on, girl demon, girl demon, girl demon. Let's go, let's go. <laughs> <laughs> any 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 other theories any other theories i mean could I it mean, be oh can i see the picture one more time bryce because i gotta tell you normally i'm pretty big on the the humans see faces where faces don't exist that that would really this is not like a face on mars thing this is like that seems to be a painting. Either that kid is like the Picasso of poop on his on his uh, <laughs> sheets. <laughs> but I mean, like, that's very clearly a face. I mean, it would probably, not to quibble, but more impressionistic. Maybe like an early <laughs> day guy. <laughs> little Monet action. Yeah, yeah. That's it. Yeah, right. the only other thing that I could think of is maybe if there was some kind of like a, like a like a a, a a a fast food like plastic thing that would go on top of a uh, a, a, a you know a fountain drink or whatever. There's like just some other little thing that just in in the shadow of the light looks different. Bryce, do you have the uh, the actual image? We do. Let's uh, load it up here. This is from the sun. Right, so I walk in, I, I open the door, and you hear me muttering under my breath, girl demon, girl demon, go on, girl demon. I flip on the light switch, and what do I see? Oh, God damn it. <laughs> <laughs> it is a mattress sticker on the Cribs mattress of a baby, <laughs> and the sheet is pulled back. <laughs> so was this a case of like a, an infrared camera was seeing through the sheets or something oh, no, no, no 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 the sheet was pulled back got it okay so exposing so a baby's face that the reason why that baby's face was so amazing was because it was indeed shooting a baby's face oh that was a really good one guys that was a really good one i i saw that photo and i'm like I've got no idea what this is, and I'm waiting to just scroll down the article. I'm like, like, because they mentioned like her, because the headlines are upset at her husband. So in my mind is like, oh, did he play a prank? And then when, then I saw that. I'm like, oh, that's so good. I never would have thought that. <laughs> that is just so, that's so good. And also, it's like this is one of those great stories because it is a confluence of like high definition cameras and whatever that like night vision technology is that makes it because it's not like traditional green or whatever. It looks like this very ethereal, uh, uh, you know, blue, uh, uh, just, and it's so funny. Now, when you look at it, you it realize it does that look like you're seeing it through the sheets. I, I think there might be some of that. It looks like the sheets are, no, 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 no. cause you can see what, it looks like is that the baby is like tucked in to this bunch of sheets, right? Oh, and I see. I see. The, what I was reading is sheets. Uh, I now see is is the folds of the creases in in the yes. uh, actual mattress. So it was pulled off the corner. The the baby had pulled the, the 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 sheets off the corner, and that's what made it look like this baby face had been tucked in. But it's like <laughs> it, it's just realistic enough. To look like a baby, a ghost baby, a vaporized next to your child, when in reality 
Just that picture. It, it, it looks like, uh, for the audio listeners, uh, almost like a Shroud of Turin baby on there. So, so picture that, that image yeah. just baked into the mattress on, on the camera. That's so, so good. That's so good. It, it also plays to, because um, you're right, Justin, there is sort of a technology aspect to it, the fact that uh, it's the the better cameras or whatever. But yeah. at the core of it, like so many other of these stories, it really relies on an information inefficiency. Maybe one of the parents uh, who installed the the mattress didn't tell the other, hey, by the way, this mattress has a picture of a baby with a creepy face yeah. on it. So what would have been obvious to one parent was horrific and strange to another one. And that's got to be, and, and this is where we, we, we rely on your expertise as an actual parent here, Brian, but uh, I would imagine that there's always some level of low-grade terror with kids, right, where there's a billion different spikes of adrenaline of like, Oh, they're doing something they're not supposed to. They've been quiet for too long, yada, yada, yada. A billion of those, right? Yep. But rare are the sustained second level, like, oh, wait, no. Now I, not only do I not know whether or not they're in danger, now there's like this, even if it is just like an information inefficiency or something creepy that now just sustains it into this perpetual motion machine of insanity. It is, it is funny how much changes once you're on the other side of parenthood. I remember hearing an urban legend. I, I, I mean, let's, let's take it for granted that this totally happened and, and exactly as I heard it. But when I was in college, you know, you start to have those deep philosophical ideas of what happens after we die and reincarnation. Is that real or whatever? And then somebody shares a story with like, oh, my, my, uh, uh cousins or whoever, my relatives have a, uh, uh, a, a eight year old and a, uh, th- uh, 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 just had a newborn and they just set up a nanny cam. And that's of course, another key ingredient of all these just so uh, internet horror stories is you have a new piece of technology and they watched as the eight year old went into the baby's room and curled up next to the baby and whispered, tell me, tell me again about God. And uh, and there was something about like that that story that is just like uh, oh my god if reincarnation was real maybe kids do have like uh, some kind of weird ability to talk to younger people or whatever uh, but then then you become a parent and you're like yeah man kids ca- say crazy shit all the time I don't know <laughs> like <Yeah. laughs> you don't you don't really worry about it yeah you're not you're you're less you, once you see the full gigantic junk drawer of randomness that comes out of a child's mouth. You're less willing to be like, oh, but wait, these two paper clips are from the same manufacturer. (laughs) (laughs) Yes. Yeah, man, there's a lot of junk in that drawer. (laughs) Yeah, we've been throwing stuff in there forever for as long (laughs) as it's existed. I remember uh, upstairs at my parents' house, my mom, and we were talking to my niece who was like six or seven years old. And she mentioned, like, oh, yeah, my invisible friend. Like, oh, your invisible friend. She goes, yeah, she's right there and points to a corner. Like, what does your friend look like? She's like, oh, you know, she's about this tall. And she starts to describe him. I'm looking at my mom. I'm like, I know this is just a kid making stuff up from a cartoon or something. But I'm freaking out right now because it's just the <laughs> utter conviction, which like, oh, she's got purple hair, she's got this, and she's looking at me. <laughs> well, <laughs> like, and then you know, they, then they like, drop those weird sideways details that mean nothing to a kid. They're just, you know, throwing paint at the wall or they're Jackson Pollocking all over. Uh, but, they, but, they're, uh, but then they're like, sometimes there's fangs and sometimes she whispers yeah. to me secrets. And it's like just through the context of being an adult, all of that rings different. Why? Well, I was like, I'm asking her details. She's like, pink hair, purple. And I'm like, and what's her name? She goes, Pinky Do. I'm like, I think that's a cartoon, (laughs) you know? And I think she's just describing the last cartoon, which she was. Did did I ever tell you guys the story of the the giant vermin rodent that was in our our, uh, 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 chimney? Did Did we talk about this? No. So uh, this is back, what, 10, 11 years ago. We had a, a, a smaller place. Uh, uh, we we didn't need much because we only had the one kid, and then we had a second one, and eventually we bought the, the much bigger place. But <clears throat> there was something clearly living up in the chimney because we would hear, like, ka-dong, 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 dong dong from time to time. And uh, there came this moment that it was just going nuts, and it was like, I forget what the 
in the moment impetus was, but there came this moment that I was like, I'm going to open this freaking flu and we're just going to, we're just going to have it out <laughs> me and whatever this thing is. Cause I want to be able to start fires in there. And so we, we hear the guitar da, 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 and it's like, uh, I don't know. I'm picturing a, uh, you know, I don't know, maybe a raccoon. That seems fairly or obvious. So Dick Van Dyke. Squirrel, squirrel would be weird. <laughs> Yeah, no, an ashen uh, Dick Van Dyke fall, falls down and starts serenading you in, in, a, in, a, in a bad English accent. <laughs> but <laughs> we finally, like, we get to the point where we all know that this is a charged moment and we're going to do this for reals. So I have one hand on the flu. I, I have like, a, I don't know, some kind of cudgel in my hand. Bonnie's got a broom or whatever. And then, uh, and then I just swoop open the flu and then back away and then I, I sort of jiggle the flu left right left right and and then arms up and all of a sudden I hear do, 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 as loud as it has ever been like this thing is coming down and we're about to have a have a showdown and it was a it was a lizard about uh <laughs> about four <laughs> inches long and it just landed comically on the top of the fake ceramic log in the fireplace and just gave it just stared directly at us with the most embarrassed look i didn't know lizards could do embarrassment and, but it, and it was just like in a british accent i'm gonna save your insurance <laughs> <laughs> it might as well have been so we told this story to penny who was two or three she started talk, talking pretty young and so uh she loved it so much that she decided that that was uh uh, her imaginary friend. And whenever anything <laughs> went bad, I went to the bathroom once. Everything was covered with wet toilet paper. The kind of thing that, that a kid would do, you, you take the toilet paper, you soak it in, in the, the uh, uh, sink, and you slap it against the wall, and it sticks, and that's delightful. So you keep doing that. And then you know, I open the door, and there's my three-year-old daughter going, Lizard! Ah! Lizard! Ah! You just missed him! <laughs> Lizard! <laughs> I, I once had to use the, the restroom late one night. I got up, and you ever have that sort of that foggy state where you're – nothing will really startle you because you're still half asleep. You know, your reactions are slow, whatever, and so you're not full. You're just like, uh. I get up. I go walk into the bathroom, and I'm standing over the toilet midstream, and I feel something touch my shoulder. Just touch – all of a sudden, something's on my shoulder. Something's on my shoulder, but I'm still too groggy to, like, react. I'm like, huh? I look over, and there was a lizard <laughs> had jumped from wherever onto my shoulder, and I remember looking at the lizard, and it looks at me, and he's like, I, "I'm not." He's like, I'm "Like he's like bad plan," and and then he just jumps away. And I <laughs> did I did I did I scare him? I don't know, but it was such. A, I was glad that I was half asleep because otherwise it would have been very messy. But it was just very like, "Wow, lizard," you know. And then, "Hey, human." All right, bye. <laughs> Never happen again. Oh, yeah. man. Well, I'll tell you what should happen immediately, and that's your support of us at patreon.com slash weird things. Of course, patreon.com slash weird things is where you can support this show. Keep us coming back every single Monday to make sure that you get what you crave. Yup, weird news dissected by your three favorite friends. Head on over there right now, patreon.com slash weird Weird things. You know, some of the some of the folks out there might be wondering, like, uh, okay, look, I get that you guys divvy up the cash and that it 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 you know you spend it on daily expenditures, but uh, specifically, where 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 does that money go? Uh, I'm happy to report that we are keeping it. We are paying it forward. We're keeping it weird because I finally, after a month of this thing being on my lawn, got Bonnie to confess to me how much money she spent on this. Fog, smoke, breathing, animatronic, red-eyed dragon that is in our front yard. <laughs> we, we spent an entire month's worth of Weird Things episode. So oh, I, my God. I spent eight hours, nine, ten hours, of, and all that money went to this awesome dragon. And now, once we have it, I mean, it is legitimately legitimately the dopest dragon in all of our neighborhood. <laughs> yeah. Get wrecked, other dragons! You <laughs> suck. But here's the funny part: they took the uh, the, the other decorations because it's Halloween. They, they had like a skeleton or whatever. So under the half raised foot, they put skeleton bones, so it looks like it's in the middle of crushing a skeleton or whatever. And uh, what people in the neighborhood I don't think realize is our appetite 
to keep this thing around. So next month, it's going to be like, it's going to have a pumpkin and a, and a cornucopia. <laughs> and then it's going to have a Santa hat. Then it's going to be baby New Year dragon. And I'm just waiting for the neighborhood to figure out that we will never not have this smoke breathing dragon on our front lawn. I mean, all right. So here's here's how it goes. You you know, pilgrim dragon. Uh, you got Santa dragon. Baby, baby New, New Year, Year dragon. Valentine's dragon. Cupid dragon. Uh, and then... Really, I, you start running out of costumes. Oh no, after no, no. Irish, Irish dragon. Oh no, no, yeah, no, no. So yeah, March is St. Patrick's Day. So now uh, you have and then um, April is uh, uh, Rasta dragon. Uh, uh, no, no, no. Um, uh, uh, and on the third day, he rose <laughs> dragon. Oh, I mean, like, if if you're not getting letters from the homeowners association because you continually have a smoke breathing dragon on your front lawn, then you will almost certainly get it. If you either go now, the dragon smokes weed for four twenty, or now the <laughs> dragon is Jesus. Like that's definitely where you're gonna. You, start you think getting. that's so? So if if you're placing Vegas odds, then 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 sometime before mid April is when they finally come to us and be like, all right. <laughs> But then the other side is that you can go like if they're like just get this Jesus dragon off the lawn like that disrespectful be like all right 420 dragon like or the opposite one. <laughs> oh, actually that till, would be great with the smoke machine. <laughs> He's yeah, just wait till 4th of July and then you make it the patriotic dragon like oh you want me to take down my patriotic dragon who's welcoming home the troops. Yeah, exactly. This dragon doesn't kneel. Oh, dude. Okay. Now I'm going to say that the homeowners association has a good position up until the end of April. Cause in April they're like, all right, what are you going to do? And then they go to take it down and it's may. And what do we have? It says honor our veterans. And then what, yep. what are you going to take yep. down the honor our veterans dragon yep. where he's very yep. respectfully, uh, big, big kneeling yellow ribbon, big yellow ribbon around the dragon. <laughs> <laughs> this thing's going to be around forever. <laughs> uh, so uh I was trying to remember was the uh was it the Green Dragon Tavern? Was that where they did like some planning of the American Revolution? Uh oh, I mean, Boston Tea Party. That's where they planned it. So yeah, so there's a history there. Oh, it's an honor of the Green Dragon Pop, Yeah, it's guys. a purple you, dragon. I don't wanna hmm. You're colorblind, Brian. How dare they pick upon you for that? <laughs> I hate your neighborhood already, man. It's just these people. It's, um, it's funny, too, because, like, I didn't know how much Bonnie had spent on it. And uh, just one day, and the, the in fact, the question never even occurred to me until I was like, man, I love that dragon. It looks so awesome in the front yard. And she, and she was like, yeah, and I love that it that it moves and talks and screams. I'm like, what? And then she, like, pulls back an ear and twists three knobs or whatever and hits a button. Suddenly it's moving. And then that's when, that's the first time that I'm like, how much did this cost? <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's awesome. Now, is that, like, an impulse purchase at Costco? Or did she have to call, like, like smoking dragons are us? So uh, I got the full story. She finally confessed. Apparently it was almost an impulse purchase last year. And then she missed her window and she had a year's worth of regret and then finally went back and asked like uh, at Home Depot or whatever, like, hey, man, where's that dragon? And they're like, yeah, we don't have it anymore. They're all gone. They don't they don't make it anymore. She's like, what? And then and then, <laughs> and then she went and just, you know, to the Internet. <laughs> like now oh now the, the FOMO had gotten so great <laughs> that she yeah. just needed to go get it. You uh, yeah, past the Rubicon of like now you're looking up like you know a uh, collector resellers of uh, you know uh, I'm looking for a cherry uh, a 2012 smoking dragon with skeleton. <laughs> it has so, it has it has like a pipe that goes in its umbilicus like in a in a belly so that the smoke will come out the <laughs> the mouth. It's so dumb. It's I, 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 it's gonna be great. I knew a guy who moved into a neighborhood. And the kind of the resident neighborhood, really, really fancy neighborhood in Virginia and sort of the resident bully there was some attorney who made his money off of like, you know, airplane crashes or something. Yeah, and that no, attorney would, he was the mayor of New York at the time. And now he's attorney to the president. All right. Do you know, <laughs> well, he, the this guy mayor. would uh, uh, would file lawsuits and stuff, was sort of harassed other people. Oh, your lawn's this or whatever. He was just notorious for doing this. So. 
the guy I knew moved in there, um, decided to annoy him. So he bought a full-sized X-Wing and put it in his front yard. <laughs> so attorney guys, he was wealthy. He's like, well, well, mister, you don't understand how things work around here. I'm going to sue you. Discovers new guy is a billionaire who is like, I can afford all the attorneys I want. I'm keeping the X-Wing in my front yard. And it was just a sort of back and forth. Kind of a silly civil dispute, what but was the, it was just I, I think this might have been a weird things topic from like eight years ago, but wasn't there a neighbor that spent like ten thousand dollars on a on a statue that was just a giant middle finger pointing to their their other neighbor? Oh yeah. Oh, that was uh Al what's his face? Uh, uh the screw magazine. Uh yeah. he had it on the inner coast or something, yeah. Yeah, uh of uh, South Florida legend, but on the intercoastal uh, of Fort Lauderdale, where you have many famous like yachts are docked there, and you have a lot of people with these you know big, gigantic, beautiful mansions, uh, and uh, he was uh, disliked by them, so he got a gigantic middle finger to point out to the most famous homes, the most famous expensive homes in Fort Lauderdale. Yeah, Florida. <laughs> hey, you know what else is another crazy place? Is New Zealand. Oh man, yeah, it's it's a it's a, it's a wild place. New Zealand's crazy, Australia's crazy, all those places are like really really crazy. And uh, <laughs> is this our new segment where we just we just bag on other countries? <laughs> yeah, yeah. And, uh, there we go. Moving on, nailed them. <laughs> yeah, I mean that's pretty much it. Moving on. Well, okay, one more thing. Um, According to somebody did some uh, document releases with the Australian government, actually. And so, you know, going down to Australia now and uh, found out that there have been some sightings, a uh, number of sightings, reports of the Tasmanian tiger. Uh, what, uh, what is the Tasmanian tiger? The Tasmanian tiger, guys? Yeah. I mean, I'm not, I'm not, I mean of course, obviously, the Tasmanian devil, something uh, uh, well known and popularized and parodied in cartoon, but. A uh, uh, Tasmanian tiger, well, I would have no idea other than a tiger that is in the region of Tasmania. Well, it's it's basically, I think, where we get the idea of the tiger. It's the extinct animal, the marsupial-looking wolf creature that went extinct about 100 years ago. Whoa. God. We're looking at a and photo of, of what <clears throat> some might call bad taxidermy, uh, but 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 I assume is instead an actual Tasmanian tiger. So yeah, it it, it looks uh, uh, probably about you know you would say coming up to maybe your shin or knee, right? Like at least in this picture, it looks like it compared to the leaves around it. Sharp teeth, uh, a beady, uh, if slightly slanted eyes, and short ears. Like I, it definitely looks horrifying look it's it's not for me to solve these mysteries and declare that i now know what's up but um i believe i'm the only one on this panel who has seen sneakers as soon as he gets back from the groomers i'm <laughs> 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 just i just want to put that out there for anybody who's familiar with with my little rat dog i, I mean that uh, looks like sneakers <laughs> that looks like sneakers when he hate when he when he hasn't seen me in a few days and he yeah. doesn't like me <laughs> Uh, so, uh, all right. So, so this thing has been extinct since 1936. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, and then what was, what was the, 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 the news peg? Somebody saw one recently. Well, there've been, so it's been, it's, it's one of the, one of the largest, last large mammals to go extinct. Okay. When, if you look at the extinction, talk about like there are subspecies that can, can go extinct that we have things like that. But when you talk about large animals that have gone extinct, Talk like the dodo bird, and then the, the the thylacine, the Tasmanian tiger, is one of the large mammals, distantly related to the Tasmanian devil, you know. But it's this own creature, and so that's one of you talk about things going extinct. This is one of the things that comes up is that, you know, humans had a very, you know, significant part in eradicating this, and so uh, the last one died in like a zoo or something like that. And there's this creepy black and white footage of the thing walking around doing circles and stuff. But it's been ever since it's gone extinct, though, there have been sightings. People say, no, we think we've seen it in these, you know, different accounts of it. And so, you know, this was sort of interesting that somebody pulled up and said, yeah, here's a lot of recent sightings where people think they've seen this somewhere in the Australian outback. And uh, I think maybe in Tasmania, too. So anyhow, it's just a 
very, very interesting, you know, story because it's like, is it still around? You know, it's. So yeah. well, here's my question. Let's say we find one. Is the move to try and find another one and, and breed it or, uh, you know, to, to bring it back to a non extinction level if we, you know, or, or is it just not nah, like leave them be how they are. If, if we thought that they were, I mean, whatever they're doing, I guess they're still around damn near a hundred years after we thought that they had gone extinct. It's a good question. So the challenge is that other species you can bring back because you can find related species that are close to them. Um, you would need to have multiples of these in order to do that because it's not like like when you're when your closest thing is dramatically different like a Tasmanian devil. I don't think there's any chance of using, you know, any sort of crossbreeding there. Uh, and again, these are marsupial. And so by marsupial, I mean they've got pouches, you know, they're a oh. very distant, you know, these are not they're not these are not in the dog. You look at it, you think it's a dog, completely unrelated. You and I are closer related to dogs than this thing is. Because oh, this thing that is a weird thing. like yeah. You know, that's the that's the spooky thing about like, you know, the Tasmanian uh Tas like the Tasmanian cre like the excuse me, the marsupial creatures is that they follow often, they look, they have what's called, you know, convergent evolution or convergent where they look very similar to other things, look very, very similar to something else we've seen, but are completely unrelated. And there are older species of this very much extinct that look more like bigger, bigger tigers, bigger cats, they're marsupial cats. That if you just saw the bones, and I've brought this example up before where I show, I've actually shown the bones of this next to the bones of like a timber wolf, and you would think they were related. But, you know, we are more closely related to that timber wolf than they are to each other. It's just this weird, you know, quirk of evolution, similar ecosystems, things filling the niches the same. Well, and it, it really does indicate that there is uh, certain certain niches that that need to be filled and, and things will evolve to, you know, figure out their best analog for. Uh, mm -hmm. And we, we've talked about this uh, here in the United States or, or North America. We used to have a lot of megafauna, but then we hunted the uh, uh, mammoths to extinction. And uh, so as a result, we lack that that analog of, of you know, wild, wild elephants that they have in sub-Saharan Africa. Mm hmm. You know, and a lot of that, you know, it's it's. We, we try to figure out when and why that happened. And, you know, you had climactic change that affected that. And you look at like, you know, cave bears and other stuff that were just, you know, short face bears, all these other things that were just super, super common that aren't there anymore. And it's it's interesting to think about, like, you know, even even in ecosystems that remained relatively the same, those creatures are no longer there. And, you know, sometimes it's neat to sort of imagine what would that have been like. So anyhow, hey, kind of neat. You I know, got, I, I, I got a weird question. This is a speculative jam and maybe this won't go anywhere. But it's like, in general, it seems like we all lament the loss of biodiversity, even though there have been entire, you know, eras that have come and gone and, you know, 99.999% of all species that have ever existed are already extinct or whatever. Uh, we don't want to see more go extinct nowadays. Um, and usually that is expressed in forms of conservation of whatever we have, let's keep what we have. How? Why is it, do you think, that so few voices are calling for massive mutations to create more biodiversity outside I, of the fact that we might create Chipotle. something that'll wipe us out. Well, you walk into Chipotle and they say no MGMO, you know, no GMO rather no GMO. And they're proud about it. We have a very, very anti GMO attitude. Uh, and I think for the wrong reasons and it frustrating. So I think that's the start is that that's part well, of it. Yeah. And, and there is, you know, at, at the heart of a lot of conservation kind of stuff is the idea that we, we are not here to play God, right? That we are, we are living in an, uh, an ecosystem that we need to respect and that we cannot, the further we seek to control it, the, the worse off we will be because there is a harmonious natural order to things. And whether or not you think that that is ridiculous or not, it, it is uh, uh, beyond argument that that is a part of how we think about it. And so like, why do we not look to play now? Why, why do we uh, say, Hey, let's keep things the way they are as opposed to, Hey, wouldn't it be better if dogs could jump five feet in the air? Uh, <laughs> be because we, we are afraid where we are, we are afraid that this is 
the more we make the world in our own image, the more we will screw it up and we will give up the, the tremendous gift that is, you know, uh, uh, nature's setting for us. Yeah, the, and, and there certainly, I think, is uh, a very good precedent and reason for us to be cautious about all of it. I just wonder where that comes from, because meanwhile, like uh, various holy books, like the Old Testament, very clearly says uh, mankind has dominion over the animals, go nuts, do whatever you want. Uh, so it's yeah. not from a religious standpoint, but but it does seem to be with an almost religious uh, uh, respect that 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 universally people aren't interested in or are afraid of of you know uh, Frankensteining something. I I also tend to think that our desire to keep everything naturally the way it was tends to correlate with our ability to feed ourselves and shelter ourselves. Uh, uh, it, when 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 we're good at those things, we tend to be like, hey, you want to know what rivers. Rivers should be good too. And also these mountains and also this golfer that I'd never heard of before, but sure. I'll pay well, you and, 50 and, and, sure. I, I, That's a really good point because right now we're all fat and happy. And now we're at the point where like what, just a week or two weeks ago, we were talking about like, should we really even break any rocks on Mars? Cause it seems like it's in whatever its natural state is now. And we, yeah, that's we, not the sentiment I was, there's, there was, there was some more nuance. Oh, oh sorry. Sorry. I, I didn't mean that as any kind of personal <laughs> dig, but well, may metaphors in there as well. My point, my only point <laughs> is man, oh man, does all of that change once your children have gone 40 hours without a single bit of food? <laughs> like all of a sudden it's like, I will blow up Mars right now with these fists. Yeah, for sure. And like, and the thing too that happens is that you, as you become more affluent, you know, you, you might express more progressive ideals in a, and you might broadcast them more, but when it comes to your own area, your own thing around you, you become extremely like you live in a very, your neighborhood's nice right now. There's a lot of land behind your house, Brian. Do you want to see housing developments there? Of, of course not, you know, because that would suck, you know, and you take places like San Francisco that, you know, become more and more affluent they don't want to change. They don't want to build new houses. They don't want to do this. They don't want to change the thing they think they like. And I think that comes to like, I don't want to change these carrots. These carrots are great. I don't want to change these other things. They're working fine for me. And so when things are working for you, you really are resistant to change. Yeah. Yeah. And, and also like, like there, there certainly have been, I think part of the reason why we have a, a, a conservation mindset uh, ecologically is because we did see good things come out of uh you know, a uh, clean water axe and stuff like that. In fact, I still remember to this day, it was a conversation I had with Andrew at an Outback Steakhouse uh, one day where I was watching like uh, Mad Men. The, in Mad Men, there was no moment of like, it's it's the 60s that ever really freaked me out until one scene, none of the social attitudes or the smoking indoors, but they went to go on a picnic and then they literally were just done with the picnic and they just, flipped the the blanket through all the crap that was on the blanket just in the grass and left oh my and god that, that is so offensive just to even hear it described <laughs> i was like i was like what the, like, like like all right a little on the nose and then i was talking to andrew and andrew's like actually no like like really there was like an element of like public litter laws that that became more of a thing and a beautified yes this is the sea <laughs> <laughs> Flip the blanket and they just hit the road. <laughs> it almost looks yeah. like a gif of like someone messing up, like you would see nowadays. Like, oh, she forgot to clear the blanket before she upturned but it. No, she's just piecing the heck out. And that, that was, was a there was a, a drastic change in our a particular national parks and stuff, and with the conservation laws and litter laws, because these things started to accumulate. They started to do this, and partially because. You know, when you move from paper-based stuff to plastics and 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 you know aluminum stuff like this, these things in three rain showers don't go away. And also, the cost of human labor was that you know we stopped using having as many people attendants in places to pick other people's garbage up. And they're like, wow, we gotta you know even even the fake Indian was crying. So you know <laughs> we gotta do something about this. That was a commercial, guys. By the way, with like. The guy yeah. who was yeah no 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 actually famous, also famous Hollywood and, and, to be fair Andrew truly believes there never was Indians he thinks it's a hoax we, we've never talked about it here <laughs> oh, Andrew does not believe that um, <laughs> just looking for spice uh, man 
Yeah, no, that was there was this famous. So I don't know if some of our younger listeners may not know, but there was this famous famous commercial about this Indian. This you see this like Indian who's watching people litter, and it, apparently he turned out to be like an Italian American actor who played Native Americans, which is like kind of another travesty. <laughs> Uh, yeah, <laughs> single tear rolling down the Indian's cheek. Yeah, I want to make sure I'm absolutely right about that and not disparage somebody who may have been an actual Native American actor. <laughs> yeah, Iron Eyes Cody. Um, uh, uh, yeah, he is. Um, yeah, he's Sicilian. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, we, as we, as we ease our way into picks. Uh, it brings up an interesting thought and I do not mean to, to start a thing or whatever, but uh, I was reading the, the madness of crowds recently and they talk about um, uh, just the different social groups that, that seem to form and which social groups have beef with other sh- social groups. He, I think we talked a little bit about this on the show. I didn't know that apparently there's a rift between f- hardcore feminists and um uh, trans uh, people, uh, and uh, at the core of it, and this is overly reductionist for me to say, but it's like feminist uh, basically boils down to man, we've been spending centuries trying to you know not become a cartoon of a pinup doll and to be accepted whatever shape we're in and not be objectified. And now, uh, again, not my words, but but a reductionist version of their argument. Now a bunch of dudes are coming in and explaining to us how to be women. <laughs> like uh, uh, I, I didn't know about those riffs, but. Uh, in all of that, he, uh, 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 oh, doggone it. I, I had a reason I was teeing this up. And um, uh, what were we talking about just before this? <laughs> oh, Jesus, Brian. No, 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 no. no. Hold on, hold on. Snake. I'm going to land this. I'm going to land this. Uh, we were talking about litter and mm-hmm. Indian, the, the crying Indian. God damn. Oh, oh, yes, yes. Okay, this is, okay, uh, good. I'm, I am going to land this. Uh, uh, in, in a world where, uh, biologically speaking, um, there is... Uh, some level of difference between males and females uh, at a at, down to a genetic level in most cases, um, but there is not that big a difference between uh, uh, people of various races. Um, and so the question brought up is, why are we so allergic? Why do we instantly reject the idea? Uh, who was it? The president of the NAACP uh, that says, "I identify as as adult dissolve." Uh, I think it was a local, a local NAACP. NAACP. Yeah, not even president. Just right, the right. But but yeah. but that was universal. That nobody had any tolerance for that idea that you could identify as a race other than the race you were born. But we do have an appetite for uh, for for being. Uh, uh, kind to somebody who identifies as a different gender than what they're born. Uh, I found that fascinating uh, because because one of them, by the numbers, seems like it should be less of a de- less of a hurdle to jump than the other. Um, I'm going to guess that nobody wants to chime in and have a hot take on it, but I, I, it was an interesting question that this book brought up. I, I will only say this and get myself into trouble here. When we talk about genetic differences, often we say that there's more similarities. The problem is is that in certain things, yes, but the small areas where there are a lot of differences, you know, like the the that the, we'll say the the in group differences are greater than the the difference between that group and another group. It's all where the gene is. You know, we we share forty percent of our DNA with a carrot. You know, and so and my point is, it's like, yes, we can say overall percentage wise it's the same, but it's like, but these little areas, it's different. And that's where it gets complex. And I'm abstaining. Abstain button. Abstain button. That's fine. Nobody, nobody needs to engage. I, I will just give a soft reminder that uh, that that book, man, raised some questions that I didn't even know were questions, <laughs> and, it, and it left me uh, like really like, well, ah, that's crazy. Yeah, uh, yeah. <laughs> I like surely I'm, didn't open ourselves up to anything here. Uh, I read Watchmen, the book, over the weekend. Man, do I love Watchmen. The book. Oh, a classic. I remember reading it when I was younger. <laughs> Loved it. Reread it a bunch of times. Each time I discovered new nuances. I'll have to say that this is definitely uh, a, a moment of maturity for me, as this time I definitely got to about halfway through binging it where I was reading all of the articles that they have in between each issue, as opposed to just skipping through to get back to the fun picture uh, boxes. Uh, so, uh, man, 
you ain't never read Watchmen, uh, the book, then go ahead and read Watchmen, the book. Check it out. Bryce? I got a pick. I got a weird pick. So over the week, uh, last last Friday or so, uh, there was a new game that came out, and uh, I, I, I there are not too many games where I run out and end up getting something day one. In fact, I didn't even intend to. I saw someone uh, write a review about it, and, and that got me thinking about it, and then I went and did it, which is just called peer pressure, actually. Um, and uh, it's... I, I've been trying to stay active, stay fit a little bit, use the gym in my apartment, go go walking a little more. Uh, and they got this new game out for the Nintendo Switch, uh, Ring Fit Adventure. And so it mm. comes with this resistance ring that you plug one of the controllers into. And so you squeeze it and you uh, uh, can stretch it and, and, and move it about. Uh, and you also strap another controller to your thigh. And so it's an RPG right. where to do attacks, you do exercises. So uh, you can do like a squats attack and you do like 20 reps of squats. Um, or you do, uh, what is it, knee, knee to chest. So you sit the, the controller down and you get on your back and you, you know, do, do, the, do the actual move. It's, uh, it, it's, it, it's really well polished. It's, it's by Nintendo. Uh, so it, it, it has a lot of polish. Uh, the, there's a there's even a little bit of a story where you're trying to save the world from this really buff dragon. <laughs> <laughs> is it is it is it located in my neighborhood? <laughs> <laughs> no, maybe <laughs> he's wearing a singlet. Oh, you can put a singlet on your dragon. <laughs> uh, on a ball, a dragon on a yoga ball. <laughs> <laughs> and um, but but along the way, it'll you know it, it'll keep track of how much you uh, run in place or jog in place. Even you know the sensor on the uh, on one of the switch controllers. You can actually put your thumb over it, and it'll take your heart rate. So when you finish up an exercise, it'll oh, cool. you, you sit it there, and, and it says, "Oh, you could you did this." Um, I think it's really interesting, and and I'm on day three of finding time to do it. Um, I, I only I think today was. The are, are you ready to show us those abs? <laughs> no. <laughs> no <I'm not>. Okay. <laughs> um, but even even like onboarding and stuff is is really really nice. So it's like you know, what's your age? What's your weight? Um, and it doesn't do the thing that we fit. Did you ever try the we fit? Uh, no. We fit. It would like take your your height and weight, and it would like very like on the screen. It would like give you the sliding scale of where your BMI was. Mm -hmm. And so if you were like maybe overweight or further, it would be this weird like kind of like ah, yeah, look at you. This is how you look. <laughs> where this is just like <laughs> here is a proprietary difficulty number based on how much you exercise how difficult you want this to be, and you can adjust it. Uh, it walks you through stretches and cool downs. It adjusts the cool downs based on the things that you actually do in a day. So like one day I ended up doing a lot of arm stuff, and so it was all arm stretches. It, it's a really neat thing. Um, I, I, I think not a lot of people will be into it just fundamentally because it's like a sports fitness thing. But I, I, I'm certainly getting... 20 more minutes of exercise a day than I normally do. As, as we get uh, generation after generation of these kind of games, I'm, I'm, I'm actually really dialed in less on the technological, you know, each one will have its own Jeep job that, that goes along with it. Mm -hmm. But I'm really interested in the evolution of the behavioral economics side of things, of, of figuring out what nudges, because mm -hmm. right now we have no shortage of apps that'll yell at us to get up and move around. Right. And I think it's pretty clear that that ain't working, you know, like, but, yeah. but there's some level of it of, you know, getting puzzle unlocks and, and stuff that yeah. can make the game fun enough and the story good enough. I, and they really do make it, I mean, it really is a turn-based RPG, right? Like, um, you don't get too far in before you get this ability where it's like, okay, now the color of the exercise that you do, which is based on the muscle group, uh, is like effective against certain colors of enemies. So if you have a red enemy, then, oh, you should do these, you should do an arm move against it. You have some moves that like, okay, this is weaker, but it hits four enemies at once instead of just one. Um, it's, it, it, it's, it's really cool. And it seems like it kind of has a lot there in terms of making it this video game sort of adventure, right? You're collecting coins and, uh, you're getting workout gear. Workout gear is like your armor. So you, you, you get stat boosts and levels. Oh, that's it, cool. Yeah. Um, you drink smoothies to restore your health and to give you buffs and stuff. 
it, it's a really neat thing. Um, and do they have power ups that look suspiciously like speed balls? <laughs> like, <laughs> I'll say like it's super effective. <laughs> You're crushing it. <laughs> Vitamin S. It works. <laughs> uh, uh, so yeah, that's it's called Ring Fit Adventure. It's on it's on the Nintendo Switch. Uh, I, I think it's really cool. I don't know. Uh, uh, I'm using it doesn't connect to like the Apple Health thing, so you have to, I have to manually enter it in. But uh, you know, just it's it's a part of a thing, part of a whole thing. So yeah, exciting. I'm looking forward to like a augmented reality, and I've talked about this before, like Nintendo making games and stuff for that. And I think you know, play Mario in your living room, full body, whatever. All this could be really cool. Mm-hmm. My pick is the movie I saw last night, Zombieland 2, Double Tap. Really? It looked Love. fun. I mean, it looked like it knew exactly what it was trying to be from the trailer. And it was. It was just a delightful, fun movie. It's neat to see, you know, uh, particularly with Harrelson, Stone, and Eisenberg, where as actors, they've been at it for, you know, so long now that watching them now, like, what, over... 10 years later, you know, take on these roles and play them again and is even greater actors than they were before and just a fun, fun movie. Really enjoyed it. So that was my pick is Zombieland 2. Uh, it, it is kind of amazing that that, you know, that that cast, obviously insane and now even, you know, more impressive than it was when the first movie came out. But but uh, such a, a, a property that I, I think when it came out, you're like, oh, wow, they're definitely going to do another sequel and it's going to be a thing. And uh, uh, it's it's odd that it took such a circuitous route to a sequel. Yeah, I have no idea what went on behind the scenes or what happened there, but I'm glad they did. And, and it's fun. It's a delight. And it's kind of neat to sort of pick up years later. And also kind of the kind of the conceit, too, is that when that first movie came out, you know, the world was different than what everybody is using flip phones and stuff like that. And so it, it's kind of funny that you they have to sort of go with that idea that this is a world where, you know, our les, last president, you know, was was, you know, in the middle. This happened in the middle of like Obama's camp you know administration that there was no smartphone culture or apps or stuff like this. And so they're nostalgic for a world that, you know, isn't like our own, which is kind of neat in a subtle way. But, you know, so dig it. So that's my pick. That's all cool. I do. It's been weird. Yeah, it has. Yeah. Here we go. Man, I was walking down the street the other day. Someone said, it ain't that weird. And I said, psh, MRFer, you're not a patron. Better get the hell out of here. That is, stop it with your noise. It's too loud. Stop it with your word talking. Yeah. Wrong words. Hey, uh, Uh, I rewatched. I rewatched Inception with the uh, the kiddos. It's How a good it? movie. Yeah. I, I, that, that might be. I mean, your mileage may vary on uh, his best movie, but I think it's Nolan's most impressive to me, considering like the that premise is insane. Like the action set pieces that are set up and the characters that are drawn within it are fantastic. Like. Of uh, of like what he set out to do divided by execution, I think it it might be his best movie. Well, and watching it again with a production eye, it really does have everything: gigantic, insane set pieces, the ability to leap from set piece to set piece, and and all you have to say is because dreams. The fact that it's such an intimate subject matter that it resonates with everyone. Uh, you know, your full four quadrant experience. It's about the only way to pull off the heist is to have somebody have an emotional epiphany. And then meanwhile, our hero has an emotional epiphany. I mean, it's it's literally got everything. And on paper, that seems like that would be a, a, a cluster foobar, but it, it really works. And uh, I, if your name is Dan Harmon, then I understand you have some beefs, beefs with it, but uh, but I, I don't think anybody can deny that it is an extraordinary storytelling accomplishment. Oh yeah, yeah. I, I, I don't know if I don't know if that necessarily holds up. I mean, the, I mean, obviously, look, like, Dan Harmon gets upset about a lot of things because he's got a lot of opinions and he's really good at writing, and so that's that's his thing. But for for me, man, I I loved it. I I continually bow at. Uh, Especially when you look at something like Interstellar, 
where you're like, well, look, that's a big complicated premise that does not quite stick the landing in well, the same way. That, and I will agree uh, with that. But as I, 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 the way I think of Interstellar is, uh, 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 let's see, Inception is an, a whole symphony. Interstellar is one note, and it happens to be the exact note that re- reverberates with me, a dad that has to leave a daughter for uh, for oh, business sorry, trips yeah, a lot. Yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I guess I just mean in terms of, like, coherence by the end. Ask somebody to explain what happened in Interstellar, and you're going to get a lot more, a lot of, uh, many different varied responses where it's like, what happened in Inception? Oh, they went into the dreams and they went into different versions of the dreams. And then at the end, we don't know whether or not he's in a dream from the very beginning. And it's oh, like, I, I, I would say I love, I love, love, love Dan Harmon. But la- literally last night we had a conversation about, oh, his circular theory. I'm like, well, let me tell you the movie he uses as examples. And let's talk about all these great moments that don't fit into there. And that's the problem is that's this overly simplistic sort of thing that people keep trying to follow these formulas and they end up with, not good movies because you know it's like like oh the Star Wars story is about Luke I'm like well it's more complicated than that and also when you talk about it and it just I I love Dan Harmon and when I'll hear him say things like for me that doesn't register as true like we talk about like you know Back to the Future oh Marty doesn't have an arc no Marty has an arc you know but his he is so naturally such a great storyteller you know Dan Harmon yeah. is that I think that he doesn't understand instinctually some of the things he gets about timing and stuff and I've heard his analysis on stuff I'm like. Well, now, okay, now apply this to Empire, or now apply this to this other movie, and it doesn't fit, and, you know, the the return to safety, like, that doesn't happen in Star Wars. Luke never goes back. There's these, so, I don't know. Mileage may vary with his analysis. Yeah, I think, yeah. It's Oh, uh, it's, uh, also, I don't know if we've talked about this uh, on Inception. It was fun to be able to share with the, the kids, because we got, you get to that end moment, the top, is it going to topple or not, or whatever, and then, you know, uh, watch my 11-year-old go like, what? They don't even, ah! And then, uh, uh, <laughs> uh, you know, the the story, they explicitly uh, state in, within the movie logic that that it is definitely reality at the end. There, There is no ambiguity of that. Um, that uh, uh, for uh, those who haven't kid, heard the story, the story before. The, it's costume or whatever. What's that? With the kids, the the wardrobe of the, oh no 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 the, no it's it's even more clever than that it's really satisfying so uh, f- uh the story as I heard it was the original ending was going to be that you actually saw the top topple uh but they decided oh wait it's really kind of fun to leave that ambiguous but uh early on and this is something I, I think this is only the second or third time I'd seen the movie uh he very clearly holds up the top and says uh, this was my wife's totem which of course asks the question what was his turns out. His is his wedding ring, and it is a hundred percent on his finger during reality, and a hundred percent not when in the dreams. And so, at the end, the ring is on his finger, so there is no ambiguity. And I thought that was so so cool to give a definitive answer and to so under to not hit anyone over the head with it. Yeah, yeah. I guess I had never really. Uh... I I I'd, I'd never really had too much of a problem with that ending just because it seemed to me that like at the point even in that last shot the the top like wobbles in that way that it only wobbles before it falls down and then it cuts and it's like oh, okay I I I, I kind of feel like that was like the last frame that they could have where it would look like that and so that's where they cut it. And it's like, I don't know. I, I, I kind of felt, I walked out of that movie like feeling like, okay, yeah, you know, he's in reality, but in the same way that, you know, Sopranos went the other direction where it's like, all right, uh, Tony's we're done with this story, but the idea of whether or not Tony dies is kind of irrelevant because even if he doesn't, he's going to live in fear of an assassin's bullet and his family getting murdered until the day he dies and right. that, that the total of all of this is that, that death is merciful. Uh, a life under the gun is, uh, 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 horrifying. And so it was like, like, okay, I, I get like, yes, maybe on some level he will always have in, in inception. He will always have in the back of his mind. Mm, like, but is this reality? <laughs> I'm pretty sure it's reality, but well, and then, is it? And, uh, last thing before we move on, but man, I love the fact that they put 
so many of those bizarre dream logic moments in reality. Like when he's actually in, what was it, Morocco or whatever, um, uh, Mumbai, and he's like, who builds two buildings that come to a point that a human can barely squeeze through? And it's like, yeah. that's just enough to sort of trigger the, oh, you're doing like a thing. And then I love that they're like, no, we're not doing that thing. But I dug that you questioned that. I I love I love I love 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 that movie partially too because like I remember when Nolan was talking about it and he's explaining the concept and you're like this sounds kind of comp and he's like don't worry you'll get it and you watch it and you're like I get it and it's I love that movie it's one of my favorite if you ask me list of my favorite it's movies a, of all time it's also up there. like just a by the numbers heist movie all of your favorite heist tropes in there the collection of the team the sketching out of the the trap the need to improvise mm -hmm. at the last minute it just it's great mm -hmm. I've uh, never yep. seen Inception Wait, uh, oh, really? Or, yeah. worth oh. check dude love yeah. it yeah. All right. I, I, I would love to hear your reaction to Inception. All right, yeah, I'll check it out then. Uh, well, here, I'll, I'll go to the bathroom. What are we doing for after right. things? Uh, I sent Andrew a few letters that we've, that we've got. We don't have to do all of them at once, uh, but we did get uh, some good ones. I also got an email. I I, uh, I'm apolo I apologize if the person is watching. We actually got an email. Do you remember uh, the generated.photos website? Yeah, yeah. Uh, apparently one of the guys there maybe Googled it or had some sort of search alert and was, uh, he sent us a little email, not, not in a letter for the show, but he got in contact with me. Oh, that would be, I would love to talk to those folks. Uh, yeah. Anyway, please uh, go take a break. Uh, Bryce, I'm, I'm, I'm sucked in on the discussion about this stupid show. Don't do it. Don't you know that you don't need to be doing that? I don't. I don't. I don't. I, I, it's, it's bad. It's actively. If I came to you and said, oh. uh, "Bryce, I'm smoking cigarettes," I feel like it would be a bet. You would. You would. You, you should be like, "Okay, cool." In fact, if I could start smoking cigarettes and not care about people's opinion of this show online, I, I feel like I'd make that trade, mm -hmm. right? But that, I, I know I would just start smoking cigarettes and then also care about other random people's opinion about the show online. Well, and also, like, look, first episode, you don't got to get married after one date. No, 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 because now here's what the discussion is. Mm. The discussion is about my opinions on the book and whether or not my opinions on the book are valid because clearly oh, yeah. this other stuff in the book is plain as day, and that's why the show is going in this certain direction that it's going in. I mean, look, like, it, it's it's uh, vintage internet uh, horse shit, right? Yeah. Like this is the internet. If if the internet had an export, mm -hmm. it would be pornography and horse shit. <laughs> like it would be like that would be the lumber and steel of the mm -hmm. internet uh, is uh, people naked people having sex in all any and all manner mm -hmm. and fucking no. dog shit opinions. Do do you? Would you do you want to be in the fray with that, or would you like to unsubscribe from the narrative? Because no, 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 I care for the same reason why people click on like this is why Colin Kaepernick is kneeling or not, like like those reasons because like there is just a core held belief of what this sacred text means to me, mm -hmm. and it offends me that because I guess fundamentally like all these issues, all these like uh, culture war issues. They are opinions that fundamentally question a truth that I hold about myself, right? Okay. Uh, and so now it's more important than whether or not they're right or wrong because I hope that the other responses to it indicate that indeed, at least I'm not totally on an island, that there mm -hmm. are other people that, are, that are, are, are gathered there. When in reality, nothing is really decided. Because again, it's the internet. Like yeah. people are just kind of there to yell things and you don't know whether or not they're doing it in good faith. You don't know whether or not the other people following up are doing it in good faith. It's a hall of mirrors that eventually leads us to all look at ourselves in the mirror and say, 
uh, why the fuck did I just spend 45 minutes of my time reading strangers' opinions about a thing that I already have a very firmly entrenched opinion on? I'm not augmenting it. I'm not searching to have it be changed. I'm literally just uh, uh, rubbing my face up against the screen for no apparent reason. I, uh, I, I've dialed in. I, I find myself increasingly, as I go through and try to respond generally pleasantly to comments, uh, especially as we crossed over the million subscriber mark on uh, Modern Rogue, um, I just find myself more often than I would expect asking, why did you say that? To whom did you think you were speaking? Like, you put effort to type these words in the hopes that I would see them or I somebody that, else would see I them? I think that constantly. Like, it's... Like, why did you do that, uh, whoever you well, are? Um, you know, the, the answer is it's not for you. It's so that they it's can for them, say right? Like, like, like the, it's the like the people who call you on the phone. It's they're not doing it to make to impart. Right, anything they're all good surprised or, when I answer, even though the voicemail says, uh, sure. "Get ready, you're or about to, to call Brian, and he's going to answer." <laughs> yeah, like um, it's 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 a and and I don't think it's useless, but it is a a almost sort of catharsis of like I have this idea in my head I'm going to put it out into the world yeah and it, it's it's not even as explicit as that a lot of times it's just I've been you know there's a there are systems in place that have pressured me into saying literally anything so here's my thing um, I mean that's what like comment and subscribe has done is made it so that you, um, you, you have to uh, comment is one of the holy trinity. Yeah. <laughs> you have to like it. You have to comment it and subscribe to it. Yeah, right. And so I think it's made the the value of that sort of input reduced by a lot. Yeah. Uh, I also need to use the restroom. I'll be back in one minute. It. Uh, I'll guide it to you two gentlemen. Um, it's almost like it kind of bums me out because I think all of that is born of a desire to engage in creative activity, but it ends up sequestering it in a place that is very likely never going to be seen by anyone. And, but, but then again, I mean, sometimes, oftentimes I'm outgassing and I don't want anyone to hear, hear whatever I'm mad about at that moment. Well, I still do feel that we are in an adolescence for this, that oh, we yeah. don't, like we we don't quite understand what any of all this means. We we just got to lessons that it means something, right? That that it, uh, uh, you know, can organize or affect on a level that isn't abstract. Uh, but in terms of I don't know uh, uh, how healthy it is or how good I should feel for being a part of it. Uh, you know whether or not it is i certainly know it's distracting i know it's something that i that is the opposite of productivity and that what i really want to bring to the internet bake sale that rages at all times is not uh, a thing i whipped up in two seconds but really something that i you know put a lot of time and effort into and i want people to say like oh wow this is cool like that's the ultimate desire i want of this mass connected well, inner sphere and I, and I, and i guess as a example of of difference the twitch chat i totally understand because everybody in the twitch chat is fairly certain that we will see what they're they're talking to us or but or they're talking to each other knowing that we're seeing it but what we don't see in twitch which you do see in youtube is people talking to other people in the chat as if the talent themselves are not also reading it. And that is a uniquely YouTube thing. You know, guy on the left needs to shut up. <laughs> you know, guy with the glasses yeah. needs to calm down or whatever. Mm -hmm. Like, uh, that that really doesn't happen. Or maybe, I don't know, maybe it does when you're on I'm the front page. Sure on larger, I'm sure on larger, you yeah. know, if you're getting into the tens of thousands, right. uh, uh, that there's plenty of you know, people that don't know the whole score and they're, and they're just reacting in the way that they're going to react. But, uh, yeah, you want to know what's really funny is that this started as a conversation about Reddit and then seamlessly when Brian came in, he picked it up as a conversation about YouTube, which was then read by, uh, the chat as a conversation about Twitch, which, 
in in a certain way speaks to the commonality of all internet <laughs> communication. But really, like they, I think we would all agree, very different languages spoken on on all three platforms. Yeah. Yeah, I think I think you're right. Strike it, Rich. One, I think I think what I'm reporting on is just that we we have a more curated uh, group of fans in the Twitch experience. Yeah, and the thing like on Twitch that you tend to see is, um, yeah, certainly people who are not familiar. So a lot of like person on the left, person on the right, um, and also like because we do a uh, we're listed as podcasts and talk shows. People are all like we get it in the chat, but we also get in the Discord sometimes of like. Why aren't they taking calls? Like they just assume, it, like oh, live things. Some people have just to have assume, calls. Yeah. yeah, you know what? We we could do a voicemail bit where like a call in a call in segment and just mm -hmm. have people call in and leave voicemails. And then that way, that way we at least know that they're not going to shout the n word at some point. Uh, <laughs> and then we can, uh, as though it was a live call on the mm -hmm. air, listen to them and comment. Yeah. Uh, Andrew, um, I don't know how many or if any of these letters you want to get to today. I think they're good. I think we can, um, I think, I know the one of them, I don't think the one about, uh, copyright stuff, I don't think we have a whole lot to say on that because I know I'm not an expert on that. So, you know, we can just talk about personal experiences. I think Harrison's one is good. And, um, uh, if we don't get this one, we put it. Hmm. Brian might have a thought on this copyright trademark thing. I don't know. Yeah, I assume you have more to say than me. Uh, that's here. Actually, let me take a second. Okay. Uh, this is the when it, when that turns on. Yeah. So let's do that at the top. Then we'll do Harrison's, and then if we have time, we'll do the third R. We do that one next week. Cool. The third one being uh, was that Tony? Yeah. Okay. I'm just gonna say yes. <clears throat> Cherry. Uh, do you, Do you think you might have input on this on this one, Brian? We can we can dump yes. it if not. Oh, you okay? Yeah. Great. Cool. Uh, all right. Then give me one extra minute to set up. Overlay. All right, everybody, we're going to do weird, or not weird things. We're going to do normal things. Oh, we should have called this normal things. <sighs> it might have been an okay name. Now? <laughs> no, it's fine. Just call it things. Just things. You Let's... know, when the, the, the simulation rips apart and the world turns to anarchy and fish raining from the skies, then we will do the podcast normal things. Like, remember when, like, Bigfoot <laughs> wasn't real? <laughs> yeah. You know, remember when aliens didn't invade? All right. Uh, you guys good to go? Yep, yep. Yeah. Yes. All right. Then take it away, Andrew, in three, two. Hello, and welcome to After Things. I'm Andrew Main, joined by Brian Brushwood. Hello. Justin Robert Young. Hey. And Mr. Bryce Castillo. Hi. So we have a few uh, emails. We love it when we get emails. We love it when people write our show for us by asking us questions. It makes our lives easier. <laughs> Um, so we're going to start off with, this is from David and David writes a question to be considered for the show. When is it time to start thinking about copywriting the name of an existing business and or brand side hustle? It isn't normally something I'd be concerned about rushing into, but is inaction on this front ever a risk? E.g. if Target released some modern rogue line of products and then came after Brian, Ooh. Does this sort of thing ever happen? Are there no brander steps to take to defend yourself against would be Johnny come lately trolls? Uh, yeah, I have thoughts on this. Um, so in general, uh, the perception people have is that you should trademark a thing before you launch a thing. Um, and there are, if you are an established, uh, big money business, you can do that. But in general, uh, and as an author, tell me if I'm landing this right, uh, Andrew, the, the moment you write a thing, you have the copyright to it. Now, the only thing like, uh, uh, I think it's usually based on publishing, like, 
uh, or no, it is on creation. Yeah, uh, correct. The but you, but you, you would prove it, it by publishing, it. right? Okay. But and, and, and what, what you want to do is create a, a chain of evidence that 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 secure. If there's ever a dispute, you want a stronger the stronger chain of evidence that shows that you're the one that created this. Yeah, and just let me interrupt for a moment too, is to clarify, and this is pointed out in the chat, very helpful. Trademark is different than copyright, and so. If you're asking, if the guy is asking about trademark, that's one thing. And, and I, I don't know enough about that. And so I, I sort of don't talk a lot about trademark stuff because that's a very different area. Right. So uh, in, in my only experiences, and then this way we'll keep everything. Uh, number one, I'm not a lawyer. Number two, I'm only going to talk about my experiences. But uh, in my experiences, uh, you go forward and start doing a thing. And you do your best to make sure that you are – building a niche in unoccupied territory. You may, down the road, find out that somebody else perceives that they have a claim to that territory, in which case you don't immediately go to a lawsuit. Uh, for example, uh, we came out with the Rogue's wallet. We came up with a magic wallet that was in the Rogue's line with the glyphs on it and everything, uh, scam stuff, and we call it the Rogue's wallet. Everything was fine for a year and a half. Then we got an email it wasn't even like a big, hairy cease and desist, or maybe it was. I don't know if it was a cease and desist. But whatever it was, it was basically there happens to be a company called Rogue that does produce wallets. In general, their brand is RFID scrambling or protecting stuff so that you're, uh, nobody can uh, hack your credit cards and your wallets or whatever. And they had a wallet product. And uh, again, this only becomes a problem when you start to show up in their Google search results, right? Uh, for example, um, uh, se separate example. Uh, basically, the way that ended is they were like, hey, man, we got a problem. We have something called the Rogue Wallet, and you have the Rogue's Wallet. Uh, we would like you to stop doing your thing. And so the temptation is to just, you know, immediately crumble. In, in some cases, maybe that's the case. But in general, people tend to negotiate in good faith and where we got to is like, okay, well, we both agree that nobody wants to confuse your product for our product. What if we made it more clear what we're doing? We'll call it the Rogue's Ultimate Magic Wallet. And we'll make sure that it only appears under that name and uh, with those descriptors. So that way it's very unlikely that somebody who intends to protect their RFID uh, devices will accidentally buy a eight times more expensive magic wallet with pockets and, and stuff in it. Uh, and they, uh, and even then what they don't say is that sounds great. What they say is, uh, well, if that were to happen, we would see no reason to continue action against you. <laughs> and so then you keep on going. Yeah. Uh, likewise, the, uh, trademarking or the copywriting of all this stuff, all you're doing is you're setting up a chain of evidence for some future argument that may never happen. And it only matters when, number one, you're successful enough that you're an attractive target for, uh, for the discussion. And number two, even then, uh, if you have enough evidence, you don't even need the other thing. For example, it's funny that he brought up Modern Rogue because there was a – Gillette had an ad – that that said a uh, uh, classically styled modernly rogue or whatever it was it was a very curious use of phrase now i have no ownership of that phrase outside of outside of that's been the name of the brand and the name of the show and all that stuff uh and uh, target is in a position to or sorry not target uh, gillette is in a position to if they wanted to they could send all the lawyers and they could say well we trademarked everything so you got to get bent but they would know that they would have all i wanted to do is make it clear it's like well that will be unpleasant for you if you do that it will uh, possibly be more trouble than it's worth and so yeah i wrote a snarky tweet and it got retweeted like hundreds of times or whatever uh and uh, so 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 in that case um uh, I, i'm gonna say that in general nobody fights over pies that don't exist they do fight when there's a pie to be split so i would say the moment you perceive that somebody's coming for your territory, then take, well, but even then perceived, I, I don't, I don't really have a hard and fast answer to that, but I do know like even my name and website, schwood.com, uh, that was all registered. I mean, that was, that was the name I self applied in high school for Brian Brushwood, just Schwood. And then I registered schwood.com. And then later, 
some glasses named Schwood wooden sunglasses came along. And there's been a couple of times that people who have worked at that company, I don't think they were speaking on behalf of the company, I think they were just speaking off the cuff, have said, well, why do you even have that domain? Seems like it should go to a real business like us. And uh, and so then what I've done is just loudly uh, screen capped and shared so that there's a strong chain of evidence so that if uh, yeah. down the road there's ever a dispute, I'm able to say like, hey man, uh, it, it has been known and in the public record that this has been what I've been saying for this amount of time. Uh, and, and when it comes to websites, you can't invalidate someone's website registration just because they have the same name or even have your name. You, you, there tends to need to be some actual like um, bad faith in sort of like what the website is. Kind of squat on it, right? Yeah. Well, and not just squatting, but like if it like oh, this happens a lot with poli political stuff of like if you got MittRomney.edu and you redirected it to say Newt Gingrich's campaign this is this is how potato numbers is how relevant so. this uh, this hot, this hot political goss is uh, then then that would be a grounds to maybe appeal to ICANN and say hey actually this is improper use of this registration but is your person like in Brian's example that's his personal website versus this business uh, that's there's no there, there's not any sort of bad behavior there so that's but, why they're probably very softly trying to get that to you because they wouldn't ha they don't have any actual legal I, I, right. To 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 answer the question of when do you get like a, because I remember scam stuff was one of those things where uh, because it was independent from the scam school property it occurred to me like oof you know I think everything's going to be fine but I just want to make sure that that I'm covered. So I did file for a, a USPTO, uh, a US Patent and Trade Organization, I think is what it is, Office, for the word yeah. scam stuff in the context of, and you have to pick a very narrow context of uh, a retail store using the name scam stuff. And it was granted. Um, what did it really get me? Uh, it, it got me... Uh, Again, that was to protect myself for a fight that never manifested because in, in an uh, alternate I'm, reality... Yeah, can I... Yeah, I mean, I think, I think, I mean, we got Contender and Action News as a card game trademark because we didn't want other game, and we knew that there was already other people at play for that phrase, the Contender. There's movies and books and stuff like that. Nobody had a card game, uh, a trademark for it, and so we felt that it was prudent to have it. Uh, uh, again, to to demonstrate the fact that uh, we had put something like that out and that if there was, let's say a boxing themed card game for the boxing reality show, the contender that came out that would actively kind of uh, uh, erode where we are. So it would, it would need to be like from based on the, the TV show. So it's not just the contender. So uh, a thing I recommend anybody, if you're looking and getting a name, even if it's a domain name you want, do a USPTO trademark search. So go to USPTO.gov. And you can search to see if that name is being used by somebody presently. If they are, and it's a live, meaning they've act, they've done the process, it's, an, it's a live trademark, I would not use it. I would stay away from there. And that's save yourself a lot of trouble there because if you use a trademark that's being used by somebody else and you're in a related industry, problematic. Um, I'm not going to say the name of the trademark he's interested in because I think it's a good one. And I did a search and I could not find it there, but he mentions that somebody is in an adjacent, but very close field is using it, not for his application. And I would suggest if you're serious about this business, then follow Brian and Justin's suit and go ahead and apply a trademark for what you want to do, because it's a good name. And if somebody else comes along and starts a related business using that name, you're going to deal with brand confusion. And if you don't have a trademark, you'd have no grounds to probably ask them, you know, you can ask them, you know, oh, use something different. But having that trademark is super helpful. So I filed for a couple in my life and never had to use them, but. Yeah. So, so basically think of it as just another tool in the belt. Uh, if the best tool is to have a dominant position and universally be, perceived as the authority. If somebody, if some company came out with Brian Brushwood branded sunglasses, they would have a really hard time justifying invading that market as I would have a very strong case mm -hmm. of why I'm the king of Brian Brushwood as, as a phrase. Um, and, uh, and, and among those, that case would be even stronger if, if I also had a piece of paper from the government.
Yeah, because like here's I could see a situation where uh, I think his name's David builds his business, uses this name, and then somebody else does something adjacent and gets a trademark for that. Then he and David doesn't have it, and then David gets a letter from a lawyer saying we own the trademark to this. It's hard, you have to you're going to have to either give it up or you're going to have to put up a legal defense, and right. that's when it gets really expensive. Well, and and then also there's there's also the court of public opinion, and that's that's what I was doing when I was fussing at Gillette, and uh, was basically just saying, hey man, I have no legal protection of those words. You absolutely can do that, but also I'm making it very clear that I will make it unpleasant for you if you decide to use those words. And also, they've never used those words again. Um, let's go on now to Mr. James Harrison. Uh, never heard of, of him. Name yeah. one time he's written entire episodes of After Things for us. Yep. James writes, so I have two videos with Modern Rogue. One hit 1.3 million viewers and the other hit 39 on YouTube trending. I believe that's good. People are following me on social media. I'm getting people stopping me to ask if I'm that pickpocket guy from the Rogue channel on YouTube. I just got back from performing overseas in Sweden. The traffic on my website exceeded its bandwidth, so it shut down Cloudflare, dude, Cloudflare. My web designer thought I'd been hacked. Brian has said on numerous occasions, when someone hands you a gold brick, you say thank you and act like you were expecting it, which I did. But how exactly does one spend a gold brick? Now that I have this video, the experience performing internationally, and a larger social media presence, how does one make money off of this? Asking for a friend, James Harrison. I mean, this sounds like a customer service complaint. I don't know that we need to air all this on the on this show. <laughs> No, uh, uh, obviously it's it's wonderful. James Harrison taught us how to steal watches and 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 wallets on Modern Rogue, and uh, he's been a longtime fan and friend of the show. Uh, but uh, tell tell me if this reads as true to both of you gentlemen. I, I the one thing I know for sure is inefficiently will be how you spend a gold brick, like the amount of goodwill and attention that's come in. Uh, I think step one is prepare yourself mentally for the fact that whatever you take away from it to go into your next project and continue to build things will not be as efficient as you would like. Yeah. Uh, I, I think, look, uh, the internet operates in, uh, uh, you know, a, a kind of breathe in, breathe out way for digital entrepreneurs. And right now you've uh, successfully taken in oxygen. So now the question is exactly how you take advantage of it uh, and then expel it. It will go away, right? There's going to be a point where the amount of people that are there that followed you because of this one thing, if you continue to produce stuff that they followed you for, they will continue to follow. Uh, if you do more modern rogue videos, then you will uh, uh, have the, sh the shot to speak to that exact same audience. But on one hand, the question is now that you've seen what that influx is, it, A, for the audience that is remaining around you, what do you have to give them that they want? And among that, is there anything that you believe they would be happy to part money with to have? And then past that, what is the next way that you can breathe in? Like the the, the next way that you can find uh, uh, find an audience and and you know, how would you take advantage of it then now that you've kind of gone through it? That that's actually a really good way to think about this is like, what are the tangible unlocks that have happened? Uh, number one, you've ha now had two auditions to let's say a half million people who have seen both, both videos. So when you appear next in front of them, you will not be a brand new person that is being auditioned. You will be that guy that I remember from those two other videos that I liked. That is that is an increased uh, place of stature. Second of all, you now have a proven track rec record with the Modern Rogue organization, which means if you call me up and say, uh, I have three new ideas for three different uh, episodes, when can I come down? Whereas before, it was kind of a question mark speculative play of like, yeah, come on down, stay, uh, we'll figure it out. And it, it turns out that it had such a happy ending that now you are a proven commodity. And so now essentially my platform in the modern rogue becomes your platform as long as you have something to, to tell. So what you want to do is create a landing place to seduce a bunch of my audience to follow your 
story and say, hey, if you want the whole pickpockets course, that's all at whatever. Like have a thing to promote. Uh, it's 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 great to go on and do an appearance for the experience and all that stuff. But it doesn't really start making you money until you have your platform that you can seduce uh, uh, the modern rogue audiences to join. I think, I mean, uh, the, the, the simplest, the five things you'd need to know about pickpocketing the ebook that you write between now and the next time that you come on the modern rogue. And as you do that, you'll always have a place to either push to your own content if you are doing your own content on the internet. But all of that continues to breathe in, right? On the breathe out, you need, like, what nutrients are you taking? Because otherwise, everyone will just show up, and it'll be feel really, really good that everybody showed up, and then they will slowly dissipate, and what will have come from it? But maybe somebody who books things internationally, but that's going to happen whether or not you're selling people a, a $3 to $10 ebook. Yeah, I I think absolutely product, like they said. I think do a, do a video, a DVD you could sell. Uh, an ebook, I think those are things you want to do now because I'm looking at your Twitter page like that, you know, it, and I know some, some performers say, hey, I don't want to sell. If you don't want to sell, that's a different thing. That's fine. But if you want to, if you're open to a product, highly, 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 highly recommend it. I'm out here in L.A. and I can literally walk 500 feet and I will run into a YouTuber with 100 million views. I will run into people with tons of views and no money because in this day and age, Views and followers do are not gold bricks. You know they are the they're the the starting point, and then you have to figure they are the headshots and resumes. You know the next step is having a product that people want, and you you seem to have knocked it out of the park there. So make product, and that's where you start to make money. Yeah, that's the uh, I, I think we've talked about it briefly, but uh, draw a circle: story, attention, sales. Uh, uh, you build the story to attract attention, you to, you build and curate the, the, the attention, think of it as a crop, and then you harvest that attention either in the form of action, please vote for me for this thing, please subscribe to my newsletter, or uh, please buy my book, or you rent out that some of that space to the Dollar Shave Club guy or whatever. But the important part, the part that nobody gets is you take that money and you reinvest in bigger, better stories. So uh, as soon as you have a harvest, you create a sustainable yield so it keeps on going. Yeah, and I would I would say like if you want a product you could sell right now by the end of the prod podcast is you could put a thing in your bio, say, hey, I do one-on-one -on -one Skype training. I will teach you a couple effects live on Skype, one hour, you know, 45 minute session, you know, two 45 minute sessions, one to practice, learn it, then a follow up, whatever. You could charge a high price for that. You could see how something like that floats because it's just saying I'll do a thing and setting up a PayPal account. And I think there are people because you have got a really good skill. You might have an audience that wants to do that. So. Yep. And, and, and also, uh, uh, it, it's really funny for James's appearance in particular. Uh, there was so many of the comments that said, Oh, when they said it was going to be a pickpocket, I just knew it was going to be Apollo Robbins. And, and uh, look, we all love Apollo. He's, he's great. There's a reason he's the gentleman thief. Uh, but, but as a branding person, I'm like, why would you think that? Because that's just the only one you've seen before. And then all of a sudden yes. you realize like, oh, that means there's an opportunity to be Pepsi to Apollo Robbins's Coke. So figure out what Apollo, not that you have to be an ungentlemanly thief or whatever, but but uh, <laughs> but uh, Apollo Robbins is playing the high-end boutique. I'm on TED conferences and all that stuff. Then, then what you can do is play the more approachable, uh, you know, be, be the Kia soul of, of pickpockets where it's like, Hey man, I'm approachable and I can, I can, uh, uh I, I can one-on-one -on -one teach you all of this stuff in a way that Apollo can't do it. Uh, sorry if that, yeah. any of that, I don't know what oh, any of these brands. I, I nicked your wallet. Hey, <laughs> for a point. <laughs> The, the end gentleman, I'm the mugger. Give me your wallet. <laughs> is that pickpocketing still? <laughs> what, what I'm saying is, is, is look at the brand space, and if you perceive it as an occupied niche, figure out what aspect of the niche is not occupied, and then and move to that. Well, yeah, yeah. and look, uh, uh, here's the niche. YouTube. YouTube, I mean, like the medium is the message. Where does Apollo Robbins show up? I mean, yeah, there's the TED Talks, but there's always reproductions of him on television, either currently or in the past, that people find on this channel. In terms of people who are speaking directly to a YouTube audience, you could be that guy. But then again, I think 
for right now, forget about whether or not you're going to make your own content because that's a whole nother question. Right now, you got a bunch of people. So uh, I would say Andrew's idea, look, high price. What is your, what is it? What is two hours of your time worth? Uh, set up eight slots, set a price for it, see if they sell. If they don't all sell, then you can think about lowering the price. If they do, then think about raising the price uh, or, or think about cutting down how many slots you have. Beyond that, I think everybody uh, on, you know, certainly Brian and Andrew are, are uh, uh, you know, acolytes of block out a weekend, write a thing. It's never been easier to write and publish a thing. Go to Upwork, get a really nice, you know, spend an extra, you know, 100, 200 bucks on a, uh, a, 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 a an illustrator to do a really awesome cover for you and boom, congratulations within 72 hours, you can take advantage of the fact that people who are watching your stuff on YouTube that then go to follow you on Twitter. So strain that audience appropriately, then strain it one more time on people that really want to, uh, that really want to spend an extra $5 to learn more that you have that for them. Because right now you've strained it one to your social media. Now, where do you go from there? Yeah. And it's, uh, we can all talk about the fact that getting a lot of views is not, it's, it's, does not equal cash. Does not equal cash. You, you've got to figure out how you use that. So that's a, a, again, the word is harvest, harvest. Uh, yeah. Like, like having a bunch of views is the equivalent of a, yeah, congratulations. You have a bumper crop. Uh, all of a sudden your corn is, you know, self germinated and you've got acres and acres and acres of, of stuff. Um, the only thing you're going to keep is whatever you harvest from it. Yep. Cool. Want to do picks? Yeah, I I meant to get to this. Uh, 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 Simon Sinek wrote a book. Start with why. Did Did you ever read it? I think I watched the you the the TED talk. Okay, uh, I liked it a lot, and he's got a new book called uh, The Infinite Game. And he differentiates infinite games from finite games. Finite games is uh, take football, right? You have a set of rules, and every finite game has a beginning, a middle, and an end. Uh, an infinite game is different. So, so football is a finite game. Uh, there's a beginning, a middle, and an end, and all that matters at the end, there's a winner and a loser, and the score is what matters. An infinite game is the American experiment. They call a target that is that will never ever be fully achieved. There will never be a moment that we point and say, well, we did it. Here's life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. It's all over. But it's the infinite game that draws people on an ongoing basis to participate and give of themselves. And he speaks about it in terms of, a, uh, from a corporate perspective, um, Microsoft, he says, was very interested in finite games. All of their talks were about beating Apple this quarter, beginning here, ending there. Numbers higher, numbers lower. We won, we lost. Apple never mentions Microsoft because they are playing an infinite game. They, uh, they are, their infinite game is empowering creative individuals, and that will they will never win that game, but it is a more worthy game. Finite games, there is... Uh, Two players begin it, then they end it. The players, uh, the game ends, and the players move on with their lives. Infinite games are the reverse. The game never ends. The players are uh, they participate, and then they peace out. The purpose of an infinite game is to play it for as long as you can. So, if uh, for, for example, you know, here we wrote a mission statement saying, um, or I wrote a mission statement saying, you know, our goal is to empower. Uh, empower people worldwide to be the most interesting person in the room, whether it's for one moment doing a cool magic trick or having a cool factoid from an article or having a rogues ring to show off to your friend. For just one moment, we want to empower everyone in the world to have that blissful joy of being the most interesting person in the room. That is an infinite game because we will never, we will never be able to get it to everyone, but all of us will derive immense joy as we come up with new and innovative ways to figure out how to deliver that. And uh, uh, it's, 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 a, it's a great kind of paradigm shifter 
book for me. I'm really, really enjoying it. But uh, uh, audiobook is read, read by Simon Sinek. It's The Infinite Game. Very cool. I'll check that out. You know, uh, to that point, like, and, and you talk about like Microsoft school, like Microsoft's stated goal from the 80s was Bill Gates said, a PC on every desktop running Windows. And then they got that. And then internet happened. And then phones happened. And then all these other things happened. And and, and he specifically makes a bit of an indictment on the Balmer generation because that rhetoric originally you did have – but Bill Gates was playing an infinite game, right? He he was was seeking to empower people, whereas Balmer, and this is usually what happens with second generation CEOs, is the founder's vision is uh, an infinite game, and then somebody comes in and they're uh, they give the example of Walmart. They say uh, that the original thing, you know, the goal of Walmart was the infinite game of can we raise the standard of living of the entire planet. For it, by allowing them to get more stuff at more affordably, uh, more affordable prices. What logistics things can we transform? That was all Sam Walton's vision. But then once Sam Walton was out, a new guy mentions uh, mentioned three things. Talked about quarterly growth, defeating competitors, and the third thing he mentioned was and continue to offer uh, cheap stuff. Uh, and and you saw it, and it was a, it was a real problem. And so um, anyway, I, I I really like that paradigm. Yeah, that's cool. That's I, yeah, I think that breaks down why like, Amazon success when you look at what Bezos was really after and Google organizing the world's information for marketing. Um, yeah, yeah, that's cool. I, I I like that outlook. You know, that in, he does. You know, uh, I did have to grin and bear it while he uh, bags on Milton Friedman, and uh, he spends like an entire chapter bagging on Milton Friedman's efforts to recouch uh, it, 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 every business's job is just to serve their shareholders. Uh, but, but outside of that, I've enjoyed everything else. Yeah. It's a we. I mean, I don't see why that is. I'd have to read the book to understand why that's contradictory to, you know, well, uh, I mean, be, be, because he points out that people who are shareholders, um, he, he questions the the premise that shareholders are owners because they don't act like owners. They act like, renters think about the way you drive a rented car knowing that you're mm -hmm. not going to have it for very long and he says that's the way people in today's market because of the incentives that we've set up people buy a stock they talk about waiting for the quarterly results they won they cash out and they move on those are not the actions of somebody who is an owner of a, a part owner of a business who's in it for the long haul uh yeah which, which, which i think is a, into... a fine framework yeah but it gets into you know, the, 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 the inv investor intention, because you have long-term investors who say, you know, absolutely. I like this long-term mission statement, but, but yeah, it's a, it's a interesting side jack, I guess. Justin. All right. I'll do it. We can no, finally, do it. We can finally talk about the, the, the big news coming out of HBO this weekend Misbehaving is now on Spotify. <laughs> listen to uh, Misbehaving from the Righteous Gemstones in uh, glorious studio audio quality on Spotify. You're welcome. That's awesome. Bryce? Uh, I got to pick. I uh, also have, I have, a, I have a second uh, video game pick today. Uh, there's a new mech game out. You control a big robot uh, and you try to save the world from artificial intelligence. Um, the very little bit of story that uh, they tell you in this game is that uh, something happens uh, and then all the AI in the world uh, decide that humanity has to be uh, obliterated. Uh, so uh, there's this entire like war economy set up of uh, mercenaries and, and merc groups who get hired by the corporations that own the territory of this land to fight uh, artificial intelligence machines and other big mechs. Uh, it's called Damon X Machina. It's on the Nintendo Switch. Uh, it's it's really cool. I kind of grew up playing the Armored Core games, if you remember that series. Uh, one of the original producers from Armored Core is is uh, works on this game, and you you tend to see a lot of that in how. Um, how the systems and the the menus are set up, how it try, how it tells stories, you know, in a lot of text and emails. Um, it's it's really interesting. It has online multiplayer, which uh, I, I have not I'm not really interested in trying, but 
it, it it seems really cool. And the last time I played an Armored Core game, you didn't have joysticks, so you had to use the shoulder buttons to move to rotate up and down. So uh, <laughs> this, that that three generation jump of controllers uh, makes it feel really fun and easy. So. It looks gorgeous. It's like, you know, as a kid, if, if I wanted to play Robotech the game, like this is like, mm -hmm. it looks amazing. Yeah. Yeah. It's got, it's got a vaguely kind of cell shaded look. Right. It reminds me a lot of, I think Robotech is a good uh, anchor for the visual style in that. And uh, there's a lot of customization. You can customize the paint and the colors of your, of your robot. So each different part can have different color schemes. Uh, your character can be customized. Uh, you buy, you, you get buffs by uh, going to the ice cream shop next to your garage and you buy scoops of different flavors and the flavors are different buffs and they even have a stamp card. So when you get 10 scoops, you get a free one. Uh, <laughs> it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a neat little game. It's, it's kind of a lot when, if you, when you first play it, you kind of need to, kind of to focus in because it, it dumps everything in all at once. But I, I, think it's, I think it's really neat. Uh, Damon X Machina. Cool. Uh, my pick, I, I, I guess I'll make this my pick. Uh, we talked about an email. Somebody mentioned that, hey, their website went down. Hey, it's 2019. Doesn't need to happen. Um, Cloudflare, there are other solutions like that. Basically what this is is if you have a website that you host it somewhere, you point your DNS to Cloudflare, and if you're under attack or you get a lot of traffic, Cloudflare is able to spread that traffic across their global network of uh, information, you know, uh, did, did, centers. Does that render you like completely DDoS proof? I mean, it it basically if you're if you all of a sudden you're you're, you're like they they monitor to see if you're under attack, and then if you think you're being attacked, you can go there in the panel and say I'm under attack. And so basically, this is this is what you use to mitigate those threats. And I've gone to some websites that are political in nature, and sometimes a Cloudflare screen pops up and says we're redirecting you because they're under attack. So it's good for that. Also, what you can do is you can set up like image caching. So every time you pull an image from Google Cloud or Amazon S3, there is a fractional cost. It is a tiny, tiny, tiny fractional cost is why you don't really care. But if you get a lot of traffic or whatever, you can actually use like Cloudflare to distribute your image handling, et cetera. So these are like, you know, you know, how does a Netflix video start playing automatically? You ever think about this? You know, you think about like, man, I just clicked on that video and I'm watching an HD stream play instantly. It's because that video is being hosted in hundreds of centers around the world, you know, and so Cloudflare can help you with your website doing that. And they have a free tier. So that's my recommendation. Awesome. Cool. Gentlemen, it's been after. Take us out, baby Billy. <laughs> <laughs> loved, 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 loved the ending, the season finale. Jim Stones. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. Uh, I I love that show. That show is so good. Stop, Apparently, don't, don't do it. Don't do it to yourself. Don't play yourself, fool. Oh, I'm going to tell you about a script that uh, uh, Gemstones partially happened as soon as it did because uh, uh, Danny McBride and uh, goddamn the actress Edie Patterson. Patterson. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, wrote a script together after Vice Principals that was about her as a uh, mom of a kid who gets cast as like an extra in a Kevin Bacon movie. It's called like like the Kevin Bacon movie. Uh, and uh, their misadventures of like mother and son as they go to Hollywood for him to just be like a background actor. And presumably they're, oh, they're from like small town Texas. And now it's they're going to Hollywood, and you can imagine the show mom hijinks, uh, uh, specifically in a post Judy Gemstone world where uh, where that would have been like really funny. But apparently it didn't uh, it didn't get made, and and that was part of the reason why when they got the you know when HBO is like, all right, well hey, you're done with the other show, you want to just keep making shows here? They were like, all right, cool, let's go ahead. But cool. I I would I'd be surprised if that if, if there's not some more from her, even if it's not that movie, uh, going forward, considering how yeah. hilarious a writer uh, and performer she is. Dude, yeah. if nothing else, like just thank you, HBO, for the gift that is putting Edie Patterson on my radar. She is fantastic talent. She has a bit part in uh, the Between Two Ferns movie. 
Ah, which that movie, that movie's all right. Written and directed by Scott Ackerman. Uh, no I, kidding. I, I didn't know until I saw the credits. Yeah, uh, it's pretty good. It's pretty good in that way. All right, well, we're gonna go get ready for Cord Killers in a couple hours here. Yeah. Uh, thank yeah. you everybody for watching. Yeah. yeah. Uh, any other streams coming up, Juice? You, you done for the day? Uh, no, I, I do have to do next top podcast here. Uh, oh, but, yeah. but other than yeah. Andrew, any any periscopes? I'll uh, probably be hopping on sometime this week. I did a couple last week to promote the book. Yeah. Thank you. For oh, everything. by the way, congratulations! We didn't even mention it, uh, but but uh, uh, the, the serial killer, number one serial killer, Andrew Maine, author, serial killer. Yeah. <laughs> author. Man, when you think of serial killer, think of Andrew Maine. He's serial number killer. one. I just, I just, I'm so excited. I've been telling all my friends, hey, remember Andrew Maine? He's a, he's the number one serial killer now. We're all very proud of him. No, and number two today. So just so you know, and serial killer author, no comma. I'll tell you what. I mean, I don't know. You don't. You, you can. Know. You will give you I, a I, comma. I, Free I comma. I know someone who's going to catch the wrath of the number two serial killer. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Thank you, everybody. We'll be back with more. Coming for you, number one. <laughs> we'll be back soon. No, Bye. no, I am not. No, I am not. <laughs>